you healed, spirit, soul, and body. He wants everything done right. So when you talk about healing, you're not just talking about uh, just physical healing. You can talk about emotional healing. You can talk about healing in the way you see yourself and, and uh, all the aspects that goes along with it. Uh, the enemy can hijack your body. The enemy can hijack your mind. He can hijack your emotions. He'll try to hijack anything that you can that he can. Uh, there was a man that uh, some people here would know, but Pastor Rothwell and I knew him a long time ago. He was a uh, wonderful missionary, uh, traveled with the Abrams, and uh, he uh, he started having these real depression issues. And uh, him and I became very close. He'd spend time with me, and uh, we'd we'd have lunch together, and we would talk and and uh, fellowship. And uh, then he would go into these deep, dark depressions. Man, born again, spirit filled, and I mean spirit filled. Teacher, preacher, uh, uh, serve God, uh, honest. But somehow the enemy got a hold of his soul and convinced him one day over something that uh, he had committed the unpartable sin. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a very severe thing, that you committed the unpartable sin. Or if you understand scriptures, it be called today, people call it the sin unto death. The Bible says, that there is a sin unto death, I say don't pray. But there was a sin unto death. And uh, I would go see him, and eventually he got hospitalized. And uh, I went to the hospital. They put me on the list, and uh, I went to pray with him. And he sat there and wept. I broke my heart. Oh, Brother Ken, he says, I'm going to hell. I said, you're not going to hell. You're born again. I have committed the unpardonable sin. I said, you didn't commit the unpardonable sin. Oh, I'm going to hell. It was miserable. You just want to turn your head and just weep because it's, 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 it's torment. And, uh, and eventually, I did this more than once. I knew he was, his spirit's alive unto God. And I said, what we're going to do is we're going to pray. And uh, I'm giving you a story to, to, to give you an example that uh, healing is more than just one, one way. And I said, I'm going to lay hands on you. We're going to pray. And I laid hands on him and began to pray. And I began to pray in the spirit in other tongues. And all of a sudden, he started praying. And other tongues lifted his hands, began to worship God. And I mean just his spirit, just fellowship with God. And I prayed and he prayed and I prayed and he prayed. And, and I'm telling you what, it was the presence of God in that room. We got done. Within just a few minutes, oh, I'm going to hell. I said, we just prayed in the spirit. And his mind was so hijacked. By these spirits. It tormented him. So he didn't just need healing in his body. He needed healing deliverance in his soul. And, and if someone would ask me, well, what made him step over into the spirit? Well, the real you is spirit. And I said his, his mind wasn't connected to his spirit. His tongue you, you know, you, you can you, your tongue can be connected to your brain. That's why you speak your mind. Or it can be connected to your spirit, and you speak the things of God. But when he got into that, his tongue got connected to his spirit, and he just prayed around his spirit and talked to God like there was nothing wrong. So the key was, he could have been strong in his body, but he needed healing in his soul. He needed emotions. He needed that that thing that the enemy had bound him with to be destroyed off of his life. So people can be completely healed. Blood pressure's right. Their, uh, their sugar count's right. All their levels are right. But they still have an emotional block that need to be healed. And I don't want to miss 
the healing part just on physical tonight because I believe there is emotional healing that needs to be done. There is emotional healing. I've gone through physical healing and emotional healing. And so we all have to understand that there are aspects of emotional side of it as well as physical side. You know, it's easy to, to tell someone that, you know, I got this situation in my body or whatever. But it's not always easy to let people know that you're having an emotional attack. Now, I'm not talking about you're emotional because, you know, your emotions are here and there. Because of your age, people talk about. We're not talking about, <laughs> we're not talking about that kind of emotion. We're talking about the enemy trying to steal, kill, and to destroy but what I do know for a fact is healing, as I did a few weeks ago here on a Wednesday night, I said I just want to share a little bit. Healing is available to all people. Healing is not something that, uh, as I mentioned, I mentioned again at Pastor David's, and I'll mention here because I think people need to keep hearing it over and over and over to, to get it done. Uh, I quit saying years ago, I'm not going to say it again because if you notice how I quote things, if I mention something about God's promise, I'll always say, you know, being provided. I, I don't ever leave what God did through Jesus Christ, through the act of redemption. I do not leave it in the realm of promise. Because I believe so many people fall short of what they need from God because they keep seeing God's provision always in the future. God promised that he was going to heal me. You know how many people that are so messed up right now because they have received so many promises from God and it's been 40, 50, 60 years and nothing's ever happened and they're confused because God promised me this, God promised me that, God promised me that he was going to do this and God promised me he was going to provide that and people use this word promise, you know, on things. But what I do know, God gave promises in his word, but he fulfilled it through Jesus. And so the promise has been fulfilled, and therefore, healing, deliverance, salvation, preservation, all of that is no longer in the realm of promise. It's in the realm of right now provision for us. According to the book of Romans chapter 5, the Bible says, death came into the world by sin, or by one man's sin, death came into the world. And so we know that sin, that disobedience of Adam, death came into the world. When death came into the world, decay came into the world, all kind of stuff came in, and that's where it all evolved. It evolved because of sin. It all evolved because of disobedience. Satan wasn't a god of this world when Adam was walking in the righteousness of God. When Adam sold out to the enemy, or what people say committed high treason, then death came into the world. That's where death came in. So that's where sickness and disease, that's where thorns and, and, uh, and thistles and everything else started getting involved because of sin. And when people would say back during the 80s that, you know, that we had all kind of words, you know, people watching people's words and uh, different things and preachers would get up and say things without explaining, you have sickness in your body because of sin. And people trying to figure out, what sin do I have in me that caused this sickness? Even the Bible said, they came to Jesus about this one man said, uh, who sinned, him or his parents? Jesus said, neither. If you read it straight out by the King James, it almost looked like God put it upon him so the glory of God could be revealed. But he said, neither. But though it's there, the glory of God is going to take care of it. So it's not about its sin, but where they don't explain it, sickness and disease is because of sin, not just because of your individual sin, but because of the sin of humanity. That's why Jesus had to come and fix it. So the first Adam opened the whole door to sin, sickness, death, and disease. But the second Adam, Jesus, came and shut that door. He came to reverse that curse. He came to reverse that situation. He came to settle the issue. I am now your healer. I am your deliverer. I am your way maker. I am your provider. I am your all in all. If one man can open the door to it, if one man opened the door to cause it all to work, the second Adam came to fix it. Amen. What we lost in the first Adam, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, came 
and brought us back into life. Now, until this thing comes to an end, according to the book of uh, Corinthians, Satan is still the God of this world, not the God of the earth. The earth is the Lord's. But he's the God of the world system. So we're not a part of the world system. We're part of his system. We're part of a new kingdom called the kingdom of God. Amen. We're not bound by the world system. We are now under the system of God. We're under a new lordship. Amen. A new lord. This world is not our lord. It's not our government. We have a government of heaven. Yes, we abide by the laws of the land, but we are not bound by the government of this world, so to speak, spiritually. We're bound by the laws of God. And if I don't violate the laws of God, then I'm going to live in health, safety, and protection. Because that's where it's all at for me to have. And so the power of God is always present. God's always present. Right now, regardless of whatever you feel like, <sighs> even in the midst of all of that you're going through, God's still present. It's just you may not get it. Because that's the story. God is always present, but not everybody gets it. It's like right now, if I look down, well, just look up here on this stage. There's different places where you can plug into. You open this. There's different places up here where they got this plugged in. They got stuff plugged in here. Stuff is, stuff is a receptacle there. Nothing's plugged into it. Nothing's plugged into it there. And uh, But the truth is, even though there's nothing plugged into that, there's still power running to that. Go wet your finger, stick it. No. Malachi, where you at? Don't hear that. Whew, thank God. <laughs> but the truth is, the truth is, there's still power going to it. When I, when, when I came in here uh, the other day early, it's early, I stopped by, and I came by late at night because of all the power outages, the timers were all messed up. And around this building, the two outside lights were on. Uh, they're on a thermal cell. They're on. But none of the lights were on in the building. Somebody could say, well, there's no power. Yes, there's power. It just hadn't been activated. You had to flip the switch to get it to work. So the power of God is always present. It's just everybody don't know how to flip the switch or they don't know where the switch is to flip. And so we're talking about how in the world do we able, are we able to get God to do what God provided if we don't know where the switch is or how to flip the switch. Faith is the switch. And you got to know how to keep that switch on because it's there for us. So just because something's not plugged in, you can't say that, you know, we, we, we don't have power. Power is always present. Power is always present. And I want to show you some verses there because I want you to get ready. And I want your heart to be fixed. The power of God is present. The power of, it's not based upon how I feel. See, the problem is in a lot of uh, spirit-filled lives that we look at things and all of a sudden we base everything up on uh, what, what we feel. You know, I just don't feel the power. It's, it has nothing to do with your feeling. It has nothing to do with your feeling. It has th everything to do with what God said. Nowhere did I, I read, nor does it denote that when God said, let there be light, and light was. Nowhere did the three that bear record in heaven. The Bible said three bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Spirit. Nowhere does it say, when God said, let there be light, the other two giggle. Whoo, listen, God said, let there be light. No. God said, let there be light, and light was. Sometimes people think you got to have a whoo before you believe something's available. People have, dear God, a layer of churches who have almost taught people how to be dependent upon their emotions instead of upon the Word of God. You cannot listen to your emotions. You be up one minute and down the next. Some of you came in here and thought it was cold. Now you think it's hot. You can't listen to your emotions. If you wait longer, long enough, it's going to get cold again. You can't listen to your flesh. 
it's not going to be a safe guide. I was doing some instrument flight training before I actually went to flight school, uh, instrument uh, flight school. And uh, so where I got my private, my private pilot license over in uh, Phillipsburg, I started doing instrument training. And I started and stopped, started and stopped, started and stopped. And uh, eventually, I knew that I was down to a certain limit of time where I'd have to start over and take the written test and all that, and I wasn't going to do that. So I took the airplane to Middletown, and I went to their Middletown flight school, and I kept the airplane there for two weeks, almost three weeks, and I completed the whole instrument flight training and, and uh, passed all of the regulations to become an instrument-rated pilot. But I remember flying a... Uh, a, two, a Cessna 210, which is what they call a complex airplane. A complex means you got the gear that goes up, and you got a fire, a, a faster RPM engine. And uh, so uh, we, we were in a complex airplane, not just a. Uh, uh, we're just in a high performance, not just a. Uh, it don't, it don't, you don't matter all that. It was just something beyond just your basic airplane. Okay, uh, I have what I have now is a high performance because it's over a certain horsepower. But this has got gear to it. They call it complex. So you've got more than one thing you have to deal with. Ricky was with me the other day in the airplane, and he says, uh, there's a lot of things you got to do in your airplane that's not in the one he was learning to fly. There's so many other features in it because it's, it's a higher performance airplane. But when I was with doing this training out of Phillipsburg, flying in the Dayton International, talking to air traffic control, we were actually in instrument condition weather. Instrument condition weather. That means that it wasn't like on a sunny day where they say they put you under the hood and uh, where they simulate as if you can't see, but really, if you peek, you can see. This was really no peaky. This was real life instrument condition. So that's the best way to train. And um, my instructor, which has done past now, he was the owner of that airport, a great pilot, great aviator. And uh, we were up there, we were doing these instrument approaches. That means that these approaches are built. You can come down through the clouds and see nothing but clouds. Literally, your airplane can be in a tilt like that and you can't even feel it in your body. You, you don't even feel the G's. You don't even feel it because the way your body responds to this. And, uh, uh, but anyway, we're coming down through it. And if you do it right, when you pop out of the clouds 200 feet and above, you ought to see the runway. And you know you got it home safe. So you practice on how to get to that point without, without having visual marks to tell you where you're at. And so airspeed is an issue. You've got to track a course. You've got to keep the airplane. You've got to deal with turbulence. And this particular day, the turbulence was so bad, I couldn't even turn the knobs on the radio. You do that and your hands come off the radio. And I kept telling Gene, we were on a final approach into Dayton, and I kept saying, you know, it feels like we're going too fast. He says, well, what, what does your instrument say? I said, but it feels like we're almost in a skid. Where I'm going, instead of doing this, I'm doing this. He said, well, what's what, 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 what your airplane telling you? And uh, I kept going, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel. He said, what was it telling you? And I saw, of course, air, you know, uh, the tower said, you know, the, 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 the radar said, you know, uh, uh, declare missed approach because I wouldn't have made it to the runway. I'd been so far off. Declared missed approach. So we declared a missed approach. We went back up, did a hold, and came back. We got clearance to come back in again. And I kept saying, I, I, I just don't feel like it's right. He kept saying, well, what does your instruments tell you? And I started looking at them. But it got really busy because I kept, I couldn't interpret the panel because I kept listening to my body. And he kept saying, well, are you going too fast? Slow the airplane down. What does your speed indicator tell you? Uh, what's your altimeter saying? What, what, what is it saying? And I was so far off again, the air traffic control said, you're going to have to declare missed approach and go back around. They knew we were in training. The third time, I was back in that mess again. Now I'm nervous. He looked at me and yelled, will you quit listening to your body and watch those gauges? And God got on me at the same time. Talking about people. If we quit listening to our emotions and follow this word of God, we would not crash. We would not get caught into things because the word of God is the instrument. It doesn't lie. It's there. It's truthful. It will guide you regardless of how your body feels. I learned more by understanding faith, by learning to fly instruments, than I did anything out there. Because my body was telling me. 
You know, they say once you get an instrument conditions as a non-rated pilot, you start losing control of the airplane within 30 seconds because your body is upside down. You just don't know what's going on. That's why the Kennedy boy uh, crashed into Martha's Vineyard because his body telling him he was going one way and uh, he responded because he couldn't, he wasn't trained to watch those gauges. Have you ever been next to a car, you had your brake on, but the car beside you moved, and you thought you were the one moving, and you go ahead and put your brake on? It's spatial disorders. Your brain tells you something is not right. That's called emotional things, and that's what you get in an airplane. But you can't do that walking by faith. This word never lies. This word has the right direction. It's the right path. And if you quit listening to your body and listen to the word, you will walk in victory every time. You will be a safe person to walk with God by faith. You can't listen to your body. I just don't feel it. Feeling has nothing to do with it. And it's almost like we've taught people how to be emotional. As if if we don't show emotion, we really are not we're, we're really not receiving anything. But emotion is not the key. It's not the tell all. It's the heart that tells all. It's the heart that tells all. I, I've, I've prayed for people that had no sign, no flip, no flop, no twist, no drop. And watch God do some wonderful things. And, uh, and I've watched people get all emotional. And nothing happened. So the emotion is not, is not the deciding factor. The word of God is the deciding factor. We were praying here one time. Uh, the person I prayed for, she's in heaven now, not because I prayed for her. She, hears, she lived years later. And uh, I wouldn't even, uh, I mean, this was years ago. Uh, and I was praying for people, and I was praying healing. And, uh, and all of a sudden, as we was going, I just praying. And nope, nobody was, none of that stuff. It was really kind of quiet. And uh, I heard in my spirit a voice. I couldn't make out, tie a face to it. Well, why aren't people falling in the spirit? And I said, wait a minute. Jesus kept telling people to get up. You got a bed? Get up. Walk. Take up your bed and walk. And I'd begin to explain that. You know, you can't judge the power of God when somebody falls. I mean, the power of God can cause that, but that's not the sign of the anointing. And then back in the 70s and early 80s, that became a big part of it, that if you are praying for people and people's not falling and you're not anointed, the next thing you know, you got people applying too much pressure and getting people to try to fall. And then you're getting people in the flesh instead of being God. Because now we're trying to be moved by outward things instead of the Spirit. And there's a lady standing right here. She was quite the healthy-sized lady. <laughs> she was. I mean, had all kind of necklaces, jewelry. And, uh, and I got done saying that. The, next, the very next one, I mean, the usher just kind of dilly down because nothing was happening. <laughs> and when I went to lay hands on her, it was like dropping a sack of sand, man. Those necklaces came up she went flop i mean it she hit so hard I, I i came out of the spirit i'm thinking oh my god is she okay you know it took me a while to get back in it but you just don't know i mean there was no atmosphere change just to cause that to happen it just happened but what i do know is god's word is true i know it works when faith is connected to it i know it works when faith is connected to it so don't ever get caught in a place in a service to where I just don't feel that healing on him. He says healing is available. It's here. I don't feel it. It's not about what you feel. It's about what you believe. It's about what you believe. Okay. It's about what you believe. The story she's talking about, and I've shared it here before. Uh, Dennis Burke is a uh, uh, angel. And I went down to hear him in Lebanon last year. Uh, he was at a friend's church of ours. And uh, I first heard him at Brother Copeland's minister's conference. He preached in that conference every year. But his friend was in his church preaching on a midweek, a midweek, a Wednesday night. And uh, just teaching. He's a teacher, not a real evangelism type, you know, miracle 
not a, you know, not just a healing evangelist, just teaching. And he called for people that wanted to be healed at the end of the service. And people lined up, laid hands on them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the pastor calls him next morning from to, to his hotel room and said, hey, uh, last night when you were in the praying for people in the altar, uh, did you feel any kind of special anointing? He said, no, matter of fact, there was nothing special. I just laid hands on people out of faith. He said, you know the young man with the light blue shirt at the end that you prayed for? He said, I think I recall that. What did you feel when you laid hands on him? He said, nothing. Nothing more than anybody else. Said, uh, on one foot, four toes was missing. This morning, woke up and had all five. All five of them were still there. He had only one when he went to bed. All five are back. And all four came back, but he still had all five. Good thing all five didn't come back. He'd be... He said, I didn't feel nothing last night, but bless God, I feel something now. You know, it's all right to feel something afterward. You just can't be moved by it and determined what you had before it happens. You can't do it. You can't do it. You can't be moved by that. You've got to be moved by what you believe. I'm moved by what I believe. I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I hear. I'm moved by what I believe, and I believe in the word of God. And I believe Jesus Christ came to undo what the enemy did. I believe that Jesus came to do what to do and to heal and deliver and to bring life back that was lost. Amen. And so that's what I believe. Oh, I got a Bible somewhere. Thank you. Hallelujah. Uh, the, the book of Luke. Let, let, let me read a verse. I didn't read a verse yet. Did I read a verse yet? Okay. I'm still ministering though. In the book of Luke. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. In the book of Luke. Hallelujah. Luke, Luke is so full of, of so many wonderful things. And uh, in Luke chapter 5, I quoted this the other day at Pastor David's, and I don't think that's why I'm still doing it, because it's because it was still there. It's just this morning in prayer, uh, God still had this up on me. He still had this up on me. In chapter 5, I want to look, look, look at something here. Verse 17. 17. Now it happened. Say it happened. If the Bible said it happened, you believe it happened? Now it happened. On a certain day, as he was teaching, there were Pharisees. Was, did, did, did the Pharisees tap into what Jesus ever said? No, they were always out there to frame him, to to accuse him and, and everything else. There were Pharisees and teachers of the law. Neither one liked him. Teachers of the law were sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was, somebody help me, to heal who? Who's them? The house was full. It was Pharisees and teachers of the law. And the power of God was present to heal them. Isn't it amazing? These people did everything they could to mess with Jesus, to discredit him, and the power of God was still present to heal them. Come on, tell me God is not a good God. God is a good God. The power of God was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was a paralytic, he was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how, they might bring him in because of the crowd. Now, you want to talk about a full house? When people say we have a full house, there's always room for one more. See, in Africa, these, these uh, Nissan vans called Matatu, they have a motto. There's always room for one more. It don't matter how many people are on one. There's still room for one more. And so, but I'm talking about when you say you have a full house. Now, if 80% of the place is full or, or whatever is full, they say we have a full house. But really, you have 20% left. People say we have a full house. 
I mean, you're talking about this house is so full, you, they couldn't even get a paralytic in. That's full. Now, I don't know how big the house was, but still it was full. If the house could hold 30, there was, you couldn't have got 31 in there. And so the house was full. And when they could not find a way to bring him in, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. Now, you want to talk about accuracy? I'm sure it was so full, Jesus didn't have the room to roam as I roam. Somebody asked me one time, well, why don't you just stand still? I can't. I don't know. I tried. Uh, I had a guy in, this guy in uh, Leoma, he's, uh, he's passed on now. Uh, he was critical. He's one of those critical guys. We don't have him up here. Uh, but he was critical. And uh, he was critical of me because I didn't take my jacket off when I preached. And I always had it buttoned. And he saw me in, in the Walmart there. And he brought it up again. He said, it's hard to trust a preacher that can preach with his coat on. That's what he told me. He says, you know, you, you ought to be able to. I like a preacher who gets excited that fights bees. That's his terminology. That fights bees, you know. That's what he said. He likes a preacher, gets excited, fights bees. He's a Baptist guy. And, uh, and, uh, and he says, well, even if you wear one, why do you still button it? I said, because I still can. <laughs> I didn't know what else to tell him. <laughs> Some people get so caught up in the crazy, you know. So Jesus stood there in the precision. They lowered him right down before Jesus. What calculation? And they brought him right there before Jesus. And they said, when Jesus saw their faith of their friend. See, you better watch who you hang out with. You hang out with faith friends, they'll help you get to Jesus. You hang out with worldly people, you may lay out there and suffer and die. Faith friends are important. And when he saw their faith, he said to them, man, your sins are forgiven you. And when the scribes the Pharisees begin to reason, saying, Who is this that speaks blas blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your heart? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or say, Rise up, or rise up and walk. But that you may know the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise up, take up your bed, and go to your house. So it showed you that sin and disease and sickness was tied to this. And when I deal with the sin issue, I can deal with the sickness issue. And when Jesus died on the cross, did he deal with both of them? Absolutely. He dealt with both of them. So Jesus, the man that let down through the tiling, was healed. But the house was full. But nobody else got healed. You would think just because the power of God was present to heal, everybody's automatically healed. No. No. You got to believe. They came in faith. They came in faith to believe. All you got to do is believe. 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 You got to know that he is and that he is the healer. He is the rewarder. I use, I interchange it to those who seek him. All right. Let's, let's do one more verse. I'm going to pray. I'm, I'm, I'm getting it on me. One more verse, chapter 6. Just next chapter. You don't have to go far. Verse 17. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with the crowd of his disciples. And a great multitude of people out of Judea and Jerusalem. The last place they came out of, Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. You know, it didn't say they just came to get healed. They came to do what? Hear and to what? Be healed. There's another few chapters over. I mean, a few verses over. It has said the same thing again. They came to hear and to be healed. See, you can't just come to get healed. You got to hear. Faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing. That day in that airplane, I realized if I keep listening to my body, I will never learn to fly. By understanding those gauges. And I've realized with the word of God. I'll never learn to walk by faith. If I keep listening to my flesh. And not the word of God. 
I have to know how to get this done. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Come on.